Hello friends, accidentally reusing the same intros because I've made so many goddamn videos here, bringing you another Dota 2 video on behalf of Dota Alchemy, and in this video, we're going to be taking a look at a game from the One Dota 2 Singapore World Pro Invitational presented by PGL between Team Secret and Vici Gaming. The lane we're going to be looking at is Nisha versus Ori, Shadowfiend versus Puck, Ori won on the Puck, and we're going to look at the exact mechanics that he used in order to win this lane. This is a matchup that I've played a few times in the mid lane. I'm not a mid laner, I am an off laner, so I wasn't sure whether or not to trust my intuition on this. Uh, so I decided to go to Dota buff and check this out. I thought that Puck felt pretty bad versus Shadowfiend. I thought this was a pretty Shadowfiend favored matchup. It feels pretty hard to last hit against the Shadowfiend once he gets some souls up. So I went to Dota buff and lo and behold, Shadowfiend is in the upper echelon of heroes in terms of advantage against Puck. If I keep scrolling, you can see all of the heroes that are not good against Puck and Shadowfiend is relatively at the top of this list. So Ori beating Nisha in this lane is actually pretty impressive. In this game, Ori starts with two circlets, one mantle, one iron branch, one fairy fire. He gets pooled two tangos, and then he buys himself one of these snazzy new free observer wards. He orbs himself out of fountain to place his ward a little bit quicker in the middle lane. And once his orb is off cooldown, he uses it a second time over to the left of the lane, where he places a ward that's going to scout Nisha on the high ground. After Ori places his ward mid, he heads down towards the bottom lane for a brief moment to stand on the high ground in his triangle, presumably scouting to see if Nisha on Shadowfiend is going to fight at the bottom rune spot, but he catches a glimpse of him on the ward mid, and he heads back because now he knows that Nisha is going to block, so that means he needs to block the creep wave. For this block, he just stands on the ramp. At a certain point, he double taps his hero icon to lock the camera to his hero, and this makes it a lot easier to get a better block off because you're not struggling to edge pan as well as clicking on the ground to move your hero. So because this is the middle lane and also this is a Shadow Fiend matchup, the first few creep waves are incredibly important. So we're going to take a look at them in slow motion. As the creep waves meet, Ori starts right clicking the creep wave like crazy. And the reason for this is because Nisha has 45 base damage and Ori has 66 plus 2. This means that there's going to be a brief period where Ori kills a creep and Nisha is still going to be working away on another creep, especially because he right clicked Nisha to pull the creeps away so that there's two separate piles of creeps. And now he walks up and gets his free hit on Nisha, but he also stands towards the left of the lane. And the reason he does this is to dodge the rays. If he's standing on the creeps, then Nisha is going to raise him and the creeps at the same time, which is efficient. As he walks up to secure this ranged creep, not only does he send the orb out, he right clicks it, and he sends the orb at melee range after the right click is about to land so that they hit at the exact same time. This makes it almost impossible for Nisha to try to deny that range creep. Once the second two creep waves meet, Ori has a ranged creep advantage and also a slight melee creep advantage. That means if he positions towards the left of the lane and he stands out of the raise range of Nisha, Nisha has to right click him in order to harass him. And that's not what Shadowfiend really wants to do at this point. And with two ranged creeps up against you, you can't do that. You're going to take more damage than you do to the puck. So there's no option but to just raise the creep wave. And Ori takes advantage of this. And you can see that as the creeps go down to the raises, he just sits there and right clicks Nisha. He says, okay, you want to kill this creep wave? I'm going to make you take damage in order to do it. Two melee creeps even go to Nisha and start beating his ass. Ori stands very close to the range creep when he's going for last hits, and I think the reason for that is because he knows that if Nisha is setting up a, a deny, then he can just send an orb out and it's going to do essentially double damage, which will guarantee the last hit. And because of this, Nisha goes for denies incredibly early because he knows that Ori is positioned close enough to the range creep to secure it. So, because Nisha goes for the deny so early, Ori doesn't even need to use the orb to get it, it's just free. So now, on the third creep wave, we come to a situation where Nisha has pushed a larger wave into Ori, uh, and by that I mean you can see that there are two creeps here, but there's also a full creep wave that's about to meet up also over here. So, 
Because of this, Nisha knows that he has a creep advantage, and he's just going to go for some cheeky denies here. Because Ori didn't use the orb on the last ranged creep, Nisha goes for the deny at a more reasonable time. And because of this, Ori is forced to use the orb in order to secure the last hit. So we can see that here. One thing that Ori rinses and repeats in this game is he right-clicks Shadow Fiend and pulls the melee creeps to the range creep. Then what he does is he walks up aggressively and starts right-clicking the enemy ranged creep and uses his level 2 orb to secure it and also harass Nisha. At this point, he walks a little too close and almost gets double raised, but he phase shift dodges the second raise. Then he gets his bottle, sees that Nisha is trying to take this rune from him, he uses two bottle sips, and orbs over to get the rune. After Ori gets the invis rune, he clicks on Nisha and realizes he has only 32 mana, about half HP, and one cell. So because he's totally out of mana, watch how Ori plays on the next couple of creep waves. He just walks into Nisha's face and tries to orb him. He doesn't even go for a range creep last hit with the orb. He just tries to orb. Also, with the Invis rune and with a full bottle, he knows that he can be incredibly aggressive at this moment. So he dives and cancels the salve. He spam pings, let's get this guy, let's get this guy, he's totally out of position. And this forces Nisha to TP all the way back to his tier 2. This act of aggression has essentially secured this lane for Ori. Puppy has to teleport in, and also we have a rotation in from the Rubik that was in the bottom lane, tri lane, and he was just kind of bored and walking to top, so he went mid. Because of the salve cancel play, Nisha now has half HP, half mana, and an empty bottle. There's a moment of RNG that happens that really does suck for Nisha. He walks towards the top lane and really hopes that a rune is going to spawn for him, but it spawns bot, so Ori, because he got lucky, orbs down and picks it up. And once again, watch how Ori plays after he knows that Nisha is only half mana, half HP, and he's got a full bottle, and also, you know, a decent amount of mana and HP to work with. He plays like a madman. He just casts all of his spells on Nisha as much as possible, and this keeps the pressure on and forces Nisha to constantly have to send out the courier with regen. As you can see, he's just hunting, constantly hunting, and playing so aggressively, orbing behind the tower once again. And he's able to kill the courier because of this. He silences away with this arcane rune. Now, Centaur TPs in to fill the bottle. And this is also a turning point a little bit for Nisha. So this is a lane that Ori, I think, is doing a very good job in solo, applying a lot of pressure. Two times, the enemy team has had to respond. And once it was even with the Centaur, who's not a support hero, he's an offlaner. So Ori has to go back to base since Nisha has a full bottle and he doesn't. He needs to fill up his bottle. But he sees that Zai is top cutting on Centaur. But guess what? Zai just TP towards the mid lane to fill Nisha's bottle, which means that he has no TP up. So if he dies right now, it's incredibly game losing for him. They're basically not going to have a Centaur hero on the Radiant side if he ends up dying here. So Ori, because he needs to go back to base anyway, and the top lane isn't that far away from the mid lane, and then also Rubik is chilling mid, so this XP and gold is getting soaked up, he can just TP top and use Coil to kill Zai. And once again, this completely ruins Zai's game and secures Ori a kill. So because of this, naturally Nisha is going to come back on the mid lane, but you have to keep in mind that there are some huge sacrifices happening on the side of Team Secret in order to secure the Shadow Fiend a decent game with all of the TP rotations. It's at this point where the lane essentially devolves into both heroes pushing out the creep wave and jungling or ganking. Uh, Ori does some cool stuff like orbing in the creep wave and then also hitting neutral camps with it. That's pretty cool, but he spends a lot of time ganking. I, I think naturally this is going to happen in games where you're against a hero like Shadow Fiend who can push the creep wave out. It's kind of the mid-game, but the uh, most important thing here, at least in my opinion, is that this is a Shadow Fiend versus Puck matchup. This is supposed to be favored towards the Shadow Fiend. It's obviously a skill matchup. And then also, Nisha was supported quite a bit in this lane. He got a free uh, bottle sip. You know, he got uh, the Venomancer to TP towards mid. He got a lot of free time where Ori was ganking. And still, Ori is ahead of him on CS. And then, of course, when we come to net worth, Ori is, you know, quite a bit ahead of him with a completely free farm Slark because the Centaur was completely shut down by Ori's rotation. So all in all, uh, Ori was in complete control of this game, and I think Team Secret ended up calling GG at about 17 minutes. So this game was a complete stomp, and I think any time a game is a stomp, a large contribution is going to come from the mid laner, especially if it's a tempo controller like Puck. 
So that's it for this video. I appreciate you watching it all the way until the end. If you want more content like this, I plan on posting quite a bit more on my own personal channel, which will be linked in the description. So please go subscribe there. That would help me out quite a bit. And uh, also, I do stream on Twitch, twitch.tv slash 420 Jenkins. I will also put that in the description. Anyway, I appreciate you a lot. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in another video.